Come on, let's sing praises to the king. He is the king of kings. Sing praises to the king, for he's the king of kings. Sing praises to the king. He is the king of kings. Sing praises to the king, for he's... Let's give him glory. Give him glory. For he's the king of kings. Give him glory. For he's the king of kings. Give him glory. For he's the king of kings. Give him glory. Now let's say right there. Say right there. Let's sing it again. Sing praises. Sing praises to the king. He is the king of kings. Sing praises to the king. For he's the king of kings. Sing praises to the king. He is the king of kings. Sing praises to the king. Hey, good morning, everyone, and welcome, welcome, welcome to Crossroads. Uh, it's a, a service that we're doing here in our home. We're staying in our home because, as you know, this is the COVID crisis, and so we don't want to ex exit our home and go to the church. We want to be in our home just as you are in your home. So we invite you today to join us for a word of, uh, from the Lord and join us for a time of refreshing with one another and fellowship. So do me a favor and why don't you greet one another today? Just greet them in the name of Jesus. Greet them right here on Facebook. Say good morning, God bless you. How you doing? I miss you, I love you. Uh, good to see you. You can call out names and you can just say good morning everyone and give the greetings out uh, for all of those who are tuning in today. We have people tuning in from all over the world. We have people tuning in from Africa, from the Congo, from Kenya, from Cameroon, from South Africa. We even have people tuning in from Somaliland. We have people tuning in from everywhere, Ethiopia and South Sudan. We have people tuning in from the Bahamas. We got people tuning in in the West Indies, different islands. It's time for people to tune in to the service. So please say hello to them and greet them with greetings of love and greetings of peace and greetings of, greetings of joy. You might not know them by name, hey, but we're all connected by the same blood. Speaking of which, I'm still excited. I mean, I am super excited. I'm still overjoyed and thrilled to know that the word of God is going forward. Hey, let me give you some stats that I discovered this week. Prayer is at an all time high on Google searches. Yes, that's right. For the first time ever, prayer has exceeded every event in history christmas easter mother's day uh, every holiday prayer is the highest google search element of the decade it's the highest ever that means that god is doing some great work and prayer is being investigated i'm so uh, i'm so inspired by the uh, the way that the word of the lord is going forth I mean, the way that the Lord, the way that the word of the Lord is going forth is tremendous. Uh, tuning in on Sundays, people are tuning in all through the week. I mean, it's incredible to see how the word of the Lord is going out. I watch several broadcasts. I even participate in several broadcasts because of this virtual world that we're living in right now. This is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Yeah, it's the Lord's doing. It's not our doing. We've been trying. We've been trying to preach it. Some of us have been trying to fuss it. Some of us have been trying to fake it. But hey, this is the Lord's doing. And it's marvelous in our eyes. And we can rejoice in knowing that God himself has caused us to slow down and focus on him and his everlasting word. Yes, it's the Lord's doing. And it's marvelous in our eyes. But why? While we're talking about prayer, hey, let's remember to pray for those who are in grief. Pray for the 204,000 people and maybe even more globally who are experiencing a grief during this time of the COVID crisis. That's right, over 204,000 people have died since COVID has come into our awareness. Uh, we have 3 million cases globally confirmed. And we need to be in prayer, prayer for others who are suffering. You might not be suffering, but pray for those 
who are suffering. Most of all, we want to pray for the 50,000 Americans, those in the U.S. who have passed. So we want to pray for their families, that God will give them a relief and his comfort. You know, it means something when your family members are passing away and you can sit by their side, you can watch them, you can hold them, you can speak to them. But in this COVID crisis, that's being restricted. So this affects people who can't even grieve properly. We must pray for them. We must say that God will be the comfort that they need in this time. There are 950,000 cases confirmed in the U.S., and that's a pretty, pretty staggering amount. When you think of how many people in your world, in your sphere that you know, uh, well, that means that maybe one in every 26 persons that you know personally are affected by this crisis. We have, we have to pray for them. We must pray, pray always give them the consideration that God is their God, ready to comfort them. <clears throat> we must also pray for the caregivers and the first time responders. The first responders, those nurses, those doctors, those people essential, we must pray for them and ask to cover them. As a matter of fact, I read an article where the expression, God bless you, you know, somebody sneezes, you say, God bless you. Well, you know, that uh, happened during the bubonic plague. And this is just a theory that, that happened because uh, during the plague, they wanted to prevent people from catching the plague and being affected by it more greatly. So we must continue to pray for our first responders. God bless you. We must continue to pray for our essential work. God bless you. That God will keep you and God will prevent you from everything that's going on in this world right now. Hey, we want to encourage you to join us on Wednesday night. We're studying First John. Wednesday night, we're doing Zoom. We're not doing it on Facebook Live, but we're doing it on Zoom because we want the action from everyone. But we're studying from a first john and we meet at seven o'clock it's an exciting time and if you'd like to join us hey just send us a shout uh send us a link send us your email so we can connect you to our wednesday night bible study and above all please don't forget to watch us on youtube on facebook and go to the crossroads website crossroads dot o-r-g crossroads desoto dot o-r-g and you can watch videos you can watch sermons keep up with what's going on at the church. Now, we want to remind you today, once again, we will be participating in communion. So we'd like for you to get your elements ready. Now, while in communion, uh, I want you to understand, I know this is not the first Sunday, but at Crossroads, we celebrate communion every Sunday. That's right. We celebrate the Lord's Supper every Sunday. And so this being Sunday, the Lord's Day, we want to celebrate communion with you at the table with us, even virtually. <clears throat> uh, please, don't forget your giving. Your giving is very, very important. Your giving to this ministry and to your church is very, very important. Don't neglect your church. Don't be mad at your pastor because he can service. He can't say your meeting. Don't forget to give. Giving is very, very important. We don't give to get blessed. We give because we get blessed. Hey, remember that. We don't give to get blessed, but we give because we are blessed. So please don't forget to give. Give generously. Don't give stingy. Give generously. And don't forget that when you give, you can give by texting 84321. Or you can give on the on the church app website. Or you can go to the website portal, crossroads to Soto forward slash dot forward slash giving. Or if you want to, you could just get that good, good envelope, write that check out, crossroads, and mail it to 647 East Pleasant Run Road, DeSoto, Texas, 75115. That's 647 Pleasant Run, Texas, 75115. Well, while we're here today, I also want to give a great consideration to other faiths that are practicing uh, their their time in hell. And one of the faiths that I want to highlight is the Islamic faith. 
This is the season of Ramadan. So let's pray for Muslims as they celebrate Ramadan. We say to them, Ramadan Mubarak. And we ask God to bless them. Many Muslims see the truth and the understanding uh, of God during the season. So let's pray that they will find the truth that they seek. Let's pray they will find uh, the trueness of God as they experience this period of fasting. Now, before we go to the Word of God, I'd like for us to go in prayer. Please bow your heads and pray with me. Father, we ask that you will bless us. We ask that you will bless us today. We ask that you will supersede our thoughts, that you will take control of us today. And that, God, you will be merciful to us today. We pray, God, that as you bless, as you guide us, as you keep us, as you walk with us, that you will be, you will be the one to, uh, to guard us and to lead us. Keep us pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, would you go with me to the Bible? We want to look at the word from John, the Gospel of John, talking about the authority of the risen Lord. And as we're talking about the authority of the risen Lord, uh, I want to remind you this is the second installment of our series, the second installment of the series, uh, <clears throat> The Authority of the Risen Lord. Now, as we talk about this authority of the risen Lord, last week we talked about how the authority of the Lord, uh, the risen Lord, removes fear. Our circumstances seek to control us, but God removes the fear of those circumstances. We talked about how it restores the joy, the joy of being in his presence. We talked about the authority of the risen Lord, how it renews our purpose. It gives us a new mission. It gives us a new direction. The authority of the risen Lord is what causes us to continue to serve him and to live for him in an everlasting love relationship. Today, we want to look at John chapter 21, John chapter 21. And as we look at John chapter 21, I want to read to you a very long pericope. It's verses one through nine. It's a little long, but if you just bear with me and read along with me, John chapter 21, verses one through nine. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, We'll go with you. So early they went out and got in the boat. But that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, have you caught any fish? No, they answered. Jesus said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon heard him say that, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire, burning coals, with fish on it, and some bread. This morning, I want to talk about the authority of the risen Lord 
and how it does these amazing things for us. How it counters us in times of conflict, counters our conflict. How it actually changes our condition and how it cultivates our continuance. So would you go with me now and let's take a close look at this passage one more time. And I like to look at verses one through three. In one through three, you see the basic conflict. Conflict is that mental, internal struggle uh, that, uh, that, that comes from our opposing needs. It comes from our drives. It comes from, uh, comes from our desires, from our wants, from our wishes. That's conflict. And, and the word of God counters our conflict. So we got a conflict that's opposing, but God's word opposes what we're opposing. Isn't that amazing? Here we see that the angels had told the disciples to go to Galilee and to wait, to wait. He didn't give them a time limit. He just said, go and wait. Go and wait because he's gonna to appear to you. Go and wait until he shows up. Go and wait for your next direction. Go and wait. But Peter got tired of waiting. He got real tired of waiting. So Peter said, I'm going to fish. And they said, well, we'll go with you. I'm tired of fishing. I'm tired of waiting. I need fishing. I need to get up and do something. I need to get up and be active. I need to be busy about something. So they said, but well, we'll go with you. Now, there were only seven of the disciples in this gathering. Now, out of the seven, only three were fishermen. The other four were not fishermen. But they were tired of waiting too. They were anxious. They were anxiety. They were anxious to go out and do something. They wanted to do something that was familiar to them. They wanted to return to something that they knew how to do, that they had control over. They, they wanted to do something that they had confidence that they were able to do on their own. But the word of God told them to wait. The angel said, wait. Wait in Galilee. Wait. You know, this is very interesting because uh, <clears throat> we as humans, we are getting kind of anxious during this COVID crisis. You know, we want to return. We want to do what's familiar. We don't want to sit in our home. We don't want to be isolated. We don't want to wear a face covering. We don't want to do these things. We we want to definitely uh, enjoy the rest, but we don't want to do it this way. We want to do it our way. We want to be in control over it. As I said before, this is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. We don't know why and how all this came about, but this is what we do know, that God is reaching and God is speaking and God is doing something up under the scenes that we can't see. He's working it out, and it's all for our favor. As we watch God work this out, it gives us a little anxiety because we want to return to the normal. What is normal? I mean, what's normal about God's kingdom? Nothing that he does is normal. I mean, nothing that the Lord has ever done has been normal. <laughs> but we want to return to what's normal for us. And we want to return to what's normal for us maybe for our own satisfaction, maybe for our own enjoyment. Even when we talk about returning to the church, we're talking about we want to go back to the church because that's familiar to us. This is odd for us to worship in our home, but in the early church, that's where worship started. It started in the home. Uh, we want to return to church so we can uh, perhaps uh, see our friends and greet one another, but we got friends and neighbors all around us that we haven't greeted. Perhaps we need to. We want to return to church for some reason, but God is telling us to wait. Wait until I get the word out. Wait until I get the harvest ready. Keep your focus on me because the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. 
Can't you see how ripe the harvest is becoming? Yes, yes. So wait, wait. While we are being in conflict, while God is pausing us, while God is halting us, he's building us and he's strengthening us. See, the authority of the Lord counters our conflict and we must submit to his authority. Only when we submit to his authority do we have peace. We must submit to his authority. Uh, that brings us to our next section. Please look at verse four and read along with me to verse six. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called to them, friends, haven't you any fish? And they answered, no. He said, throw your net out on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul in the fish because it was such a great number. Here it is, we have this construction going on. God is building us. He is building our condition. He's building our faith. He's building our perseverance. But most of all, he's building our obedience. Yes, God is building our obedience. Now, please notice that all night long, in the dark of night, as the fishermen who knew how to fish, as they knew what they were doing, as they were applying themselves the best they knew how, they couldn't do a, a thing. They got no catches. There was nothing that they could catch. Ain't that something? But then here's Jesus early in the morning, standing on the shore. He's standing on the shore telling them how to fish. Jesus Christ, the authority of the risen Lord, is standing on, on solid ground and telling them where to cast. And it's early morning. He's telling them, if you cast now, you'll catch a lot. I'm sure that they thought, well, you can't catch nothing in the morning time. We've been fishing all night. But they were obedient. Only after obedience were they able to do what they set out to do. Jesus wanted to construct or to build the faith of the disciples with a miraculous catch. He had to use what they were familiar with. They were familiar with fishing, and so he used this miraculous catch to build their faith in him. He is still the risen Lord. And he uses obedience as a tool he still uses obedience as a tool to build our faith. Obedience as a tool to build our faith. Not just, yes, Lord, I'll go, but the sacrifices that we make in obedience. So right now, this is a tremendous sacrifice. Right now, being at home, right now, being with your spouse, right now. I mean, it's very, very difficult just to be in the house by yourself. This is very, very difficult. Not go anywhere is very, very difficult. I don't care how introverted you may be or how introverted you may be. This is a difficult situation. But in this period of obedience, God is building our faith. He's constructing something for the future that we have never experienced before. I'm reminded of a story in Genesis chapter 22. It's the story of Abraham. And I'm sure you know this story. The Lord told Abraham, sacrifice your son, your only son, Isaac, and take him and do it in the morning. And get up early in the morning. And the Bible says that Abraham got up early in the morning. He didn't talk with Sarah. He didn't consult anyone, but he was obedient. He took a few servants and he mounted the donkeys and he took Isaac to sacrifice. Can you imagine the pain of this old man? who had waited all these years to finally have a son, had waited all this time, and then the son is finally born, and God tells him, sacrifice him to me. Kill him and sacrifice him to me. See, obedience requires some sacrifice. Each step he took, 
I'm sure he was waiting for the Lord to change his mind. I'm sure he was waiting for the Lord to say, uh, uh, let's go this way, let's go that way. No, the Lord didn't even speak to him as he was following out in obedience what the word had told him, what the Lord had told him originally. Yeah, see, that's what God does. He causes a sacrifice to bring about obedience. Isaac said to him, Father, I see the wood. We got the fire. But, but, but where's the sacrifice? And here is the moment of Abraham's faith. He said, God himself will provide the sacrifice. Hmm. See, in obedience, there is also a blessing. Like the fishermen who had fished all night and who had not caught anything. But when they obeyed the word of the Lord and cast their net out on the other side of the boat, hauled in a large catch, after obedience, there's always the great blessing of God. You and I, we don't understand what God is doing right now. We're, we're trying to figure it out. But God is ready to bless us in a miraculous way. And right now, he's building our faith to believe him. Yes, he does sustain us. Yes, he does keep us. Yes, he wakes us up every morning. But there's a greater work that God wants us to do for him. And the authority of the risen Lord, it lies in that great work. And he needs to build us. He needs to strengthen us. He needs to guide us. His authority allows him to know how to build us, how to construct us. His authority as the risen Lord guides us into a future of blessing. As he's building us, he's building our minds, our doubtful minds. He's building our shattered hearts, our fragmented lives, and he's repairing and he's restoring not only relationships, but doubts and fears that we've had in our lives for years and years. Many of us are coming to grips with our past, and we're, we're reconsidering how we could have and what we should have and how we are doing. But, but God himself is reconstructing. He is building our condition. He is changing us for his good. Now, in this story, there is a remarkable passage, and it's found in verse 9. Would you read verse 9 with me, please? When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals. There with fish on it and some bread. <clears throat> when you think of a fire, you think of fish and bread, you say it must be eating time. But here I'd like to say that what the authority of the risen Lord is doing is cultivating our continuance. Yes, God is cultivating, like preparing the soil, like building the land, like plowing, like turning over. He's digging us up. He's, he's uprooting something in us. He's cultivating us, preparing us for another season of planting where we'll bring much fruit. God is cultivating our continuance. Continuance is the quality of permanence. You know, many times we think of God using me today, right now. Use me right now, Jesus. But God wants to use us for the long haul. He's concerned about you for the long haul. That's why he gave you everlasting life. God didn't just give you everlasting life so you could just live. God gave you everlasting life so that you have a permanence in relationship, permanence in faith, permanence in obedience with him. He has to cultivate this continuance in our life. I praise him for that. Now, these coals are very, very significant. Coals bring warmth. We know that. But look at who comes to the fire, who gets out of their boat first, who swims. It's Peter. Yes, it's Peter. Peter, the hothead. Peter, the spokesman. Peter, the one who couldn't wait to get up and do something, to do something that he knew how to do. 
Peter might have said, you know, I got to feed my family. I got to get out here and do something. I don't know what Peter was thinking about. But I do know this. Peter was the one who came to the Lord first, and he saw the coals burning. And I could just imagine what was going through his mind. In your, in my mind, we approach a barbecue and we smell it. Mmm. We, we feel the heat. Oh, yeah. But in Peter's mind, he thought of failure. All Peter could think about was his failure. You see, it was the night that Jesus was betrayed that Peter snuck in to hear the accusations against Peter. He had just, he had just heard, he had just said that I'm not going to uh, leave you, God. I'll never forsake you. I, I, I'm always with you. He rebuked Jesus. You're not going to die. I got your back. But here, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, as he snuck in, he sat by a fire. And a young girl said, aren't you with him? And he said, no, I'm not with him. I'm not with him. That was his first failure. Another young girl said, no, I know you with him. I've seen you with him. He said, no, that wasn't me. That wasn't me. That was his second failure. Peter told, Jesus had told Peter, before the rooster crows three times, you, you'll, you'll already have died me three times. And here it is, early in the morning, rooster is crowing, and Peter has already denied Jesus because when they came to him the third time and said, this is one of the ones who was with him, Peter not only denied him, but he began to curse and act ugly act indignant, he failed Jesus. Sitting by the fire, he thought about his failure. You know, failure causes us to retreat from God. We back up from God. No, God, I, I let you down this time. I messed up this time. I, I can't come near you. I, I, I gotta stay away from you. Many times we leave the church, sometimes for a moral failure, sometime for a relational failure. And when we say, because I failed, I have to stay away from God. Failure causes us to stay away from family. We've let them down. And so we walk out on our family. And failure causes us to avoid our friends. Uh, many times we uh, come into circumstances where our friends are so valuable and important to our life, but because of failure, we avoid them. Failure. 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 The cold night that Peter denied Christ is now met with the warmth of the day. A fire with coals and fish on it. The warmth of a meal where Jesus is cultivating a continuance of Peter. Peter felt like, I can't serve you, Lord. I got to go back to fishing. I can't do this. I got to return back to what I know. And Jesus speaks to him and says, I love you. I chose you. I forgive you. Jesus cultivates our continuance in him, letting us know that we can never, ever release ourselves from him. But even in our failure, he is still with us. He still loves us. He still chose us. He still forgives us. The authority of the risen Lord commands that we continue in ministry. We continue with his mission, not our desires. We continue with his purpose for his glory, not our own glory. We don't do it because we're somebody or we will become somebody, but it's all for the glory of Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. We always continue 
in obedience, not rebellion. We follow him in obedience, not contrary. But we step by step, inch by inch, obey the Lord because he has built us. He has conditioned us and he has cultivated us and he has forgiven us. And he's given us the permission to continue where we have failed. As we continue, we continue in victory, never failure, never defeat. We continue in victory because the victory was won on Calvary. He won the victory. We can't win the victory. He won the victory on Calvary's cross for you and I. And because he is victorious, we are victorious as his children, as his followers, as those who recognize he is the risen Lord who is worthy to receive our praise, who is worthy to receive our love, who is worthy to receive all of our life in obedience to his great mission, the mission of the church. Perhaps you feel like you need to reconnect with the authority of God, of the risen Lord. Perhaps you feel like you have failed the Lord and you just need to stay away for a little while. Perhaps you felt like even in this period of, of confinement that you need uh, to, to, to repent of something. I don't know. But here's what I do know. God is not mad with you. God is not angry with you. God isn't counting your sins against you. He's not holding this against you and he's not ready to say, okay, you're out now. No, God's love is great for you. He wants you and he wants to have a personal relationship with you. And you know, I messed up big time in my life, but God has forgiven me. I know he'll do the same for you. I know that God and all of his love and grace and mercy, he is so powerful. He is so wonderful. that He is willing to not only send his son to die, but raise him up so that he has all authority to guide us to cultivate us, to build us, and to counter us. He settles us down when we're anxious. He calms us, and he soothes us. He did all that for you and me. He's great. Perhaps you do feel disconnected from the Lord, and perhaps you feel I'm, I, everything is okay, but would you just pray for me because I am getting a little anxious. And I do want to go out and do things my way. I'm not willing to wait on the Lord. We must wait on the Lord. I'm waiting on the Lord. I'm waiting on Jesus. I'm not waiting on the governor. I'm not waiting on the president. Those political leaders have a responsibility, and I pray for them daily. But I'm trusting that God will guide us. I'm trusting that God will lead us. And as they give direction, I'm willing to follow as much as possible, but I must use the wisdom and the divine knowledge of God before executing anything. I encourage you to do the same thing. We as people of God must be obedient and in step with God as we wait on him. Once again, this is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Well, I'm going to ask you to pray with me now. I'm going to ask for you to pray with me for God to give you the ability to wait on him. But most of all, I'm going to ask for those of you who are watching right now, who are tuning into us, who might not have a relationship with Jesus. I'm going to ask if you would pray and if you would ask Christ to allow you to place your trust in him, that you would believe that he came that he lived and that he died for your sins, that you might, be re you might be renewed in relationship with God our Father forever and ever. I'm gonna ask you to enter a state of grace. We can't earn it. Only God can do it. And I'm gonna ask you, as you pray with me, if you're at home, you can pray by yourself if you want to pray silently, as long as you pray in your heart, as long as you trust God in your heart. He receives it and he understands. So please pray with me now. Heavenly Father, we come now 
thanking you for this period of understanding as the risen Lord that you counter our conflict. That God, as you calm us in this period of waiting, that you will have greater glory because you change our condition. You construct us, you build it. And God, you have, con you have cultivated this continuance. You've told us that yes, you, 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 you might have not have done everything that you thought was right, but God, you have forgiven us. So God, we pray that you will give us peace and calm as we wait on you. God, we ask for others who may not know you, who are sitting here and admitting, I don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I have not placed my trust in him. We pray that you will allow them the boldness to say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I have failed you. But now, God, I come to you. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe that he came, he died, and he rose again, and that he is the Lord. I pray you will enter my heart and be my Lord and that you will keep me and grant me the grace of eternal life. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much, friends, for joining me today. We're gonna to have communion in a moment, but before we go to communion, I do encourage you just one last time, one last time. As we're going out and as we're sending the word forward, uh, we need your contribution, so please give. And as you give to the Lord, we pray that you will be encouraged through your giving, that you will continue to serve and you will serve with purpose, the purpose under the authority of the risen Lord. As we go to communion now, we have bread and we have juice here. You might have cracker, you, you might have goldfish, you might have a piece of toast, whatever you have, let's share it together. I'm going to pray for this period now and ask for you to join me in prayer. Father, bless our elements and bless us as we come to communion. We commune with you, we commune with one another, and as we do, bless us and keep us. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask my wife to join me now. <clears throat> how you doing, baby? Good. How are you? I'm doing good. <laughs> and as she joins me today for communion, we're so honored uh, to join this time with you all in your home. We have here bread and we have wafers here. And as we have these wafers, <clears throat> we take these wafers, remembering what Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. Take it and eat it. Let's eat together. In the same way, on the same night, Jesus took the cup and when he took the cup, he said, this is the cup of my blood, the new covenant poured out for you. And it was poured out for you that you might be renewed in your relationship with the Father. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. And he commanded his disciples to take it and to drink all of it. You and I are his disciples. Let's take the cup and drink all of it as a sign that Jesus Christ is the risen Lord. 